This is a podcast produced by Ashridge Business School. Leadership, Change and Dialogue Dr Stephen Adamson is a consultant here at Ashridge, specialising in leadership, change and communications. So I'd like to talk about leadership, change and dialogue. And in particular, I'd like to invite you to think about your role as a leader in a period of change. First of all, we need to define change. And I'm thinking of change in the context, for example, of significant organisational restructuring or mergers or demergers or, for example, the implementation of a large-scale IT project or, for example, the whole of an organisation moving to a new building. And, of course, I'm also thinking of change in the context of uh, values and culture programmes that are designed to shift individuals' behaviours in a direction that's more likely to support the espoused values of the organisation. But I want to say something right up front, and that is that in my experience, I do not believe you can manage change. I'll say that again. You cannot manage change, particularly where people are involved. But what you can do is you can create an environment within which transformation begins and change becomes the outcome. When it comes to thinking about change, we have hundreds, if not thousands of years behind us of thinking of organisations as in some way hierarchically driven machine bureaucracies. And so it's not surprising that when it comes to thinking about change, we tend to think of an organisation as in some way a machine that can be tweaked and adjusted, and the outcome will become inevitable. And so, for example, in the late 19th century, F.W. Taylor talked about the scientification of management. And that dominant paradigm of thinking has run all the way through the 20th century in most large organisations. The problem with that way of thinking is it tends to drive us in the direction that change management is about change from the top. So, for example, John Cotter and other authors would talk about the roles and responsibilities of leaders in setting the vision, creating some sense of urgency, and then marshalling resources in the direction of the intended change. This is all well and good, but when it comes to large-scale change programmes that involve large numbers of people, we also need to think about change from the bottom up. And what we mean by that in practice is how we're going to engage people in the larger conversation about the nature of the change in the organisation and their role in it. For much of the 20th century, most organisations have focused on some kind of combination of change top-down combined with change bottom-up. But there was an interesting statistic in 2003 which struck me as absolutely fascinating. In 2003, in the UK, we spent something in excess of $2 billion on consultants and consultancy in support of large-scale change programs. But the interesting thing is that that research and many other research programs since have shown us that something in excess of 85% of those kinds of large-scale change programs have failed to deliver on their original mandate. In other words, the benefits that were originally conceived by the organization did not or have not yet been able to prevail. So there's an interesting question here. If we spend an awful lot of time and money focusing on strategy and structure and processes and systems and we invest huge amounts of money in leadership and management training programs in order to shift attitudes and create change, the question is, why isn't change sticking? It must be that there's something missing somewhere in the equation. And this is where I think leadership and dialogue become relevant to this conversation. In my view, Leaders have a number of different roles to perform. Clearly, they have a, a role around strategy, a role around planning, a role around organisational management, and of course, notwithstanding their role with shareholders, they also have a wider role in a stakeholder community. However, when it comes down to it, there is one critical role that the leader or the leadership team must perform if change is going to stick. In my experience, there's no such thing as a change-resistant person. Now, you might be listening to this program and thinking, well, that's crazy, Steve. In my experience, resistance is a product of fear and anxiety. And those people in our organisations that seem on the surface to be resisting change are simply lacking a larger understanding of the nature for change, the case for change, and their role within it. It's perhaps not surprising, therefore, that I strongly advocate that the key role of the leader in an organisation is to tell a compelling story about the future a story which engages not, only, uh, engages not only minds, but also hearts as well. And without this kind of compelling story as an everyday conversation within the organisation, 
there comes a point at which people can't grab onto something different and therefore change won't happen. So in my work with leaders and leadership teams, I spend a lot of time helping them to craft what I call these corporate stories. They're stories in which there is a vision of the future which is being painted, but not just in sort of big woolly words that appeases the stakeholder communities which those organizations serve, but in words that will engage hearts and minds and really help people to understand the nature of the role insofar as it affects them. So by extension, I actually think that the thing that makes change work is the quality of dialogue and everyday conversation in response to those stories. In fact, in my experience, the difference between a high-performing leadership team and a team that's not performing quite so well is literally, oftentimes, the quality of conversation that's going on around that leadership table. Where, for example, there is a high degree of adult-to-adult, -adult, robust, challenging conversation, conversation in which the sacred cows and the elephants in the room are named and dealt with there and then, you will find a high degree of trust, and that trust will engender a deep sense of relationship between the key leaders, and that will drive performance. In organisations where performance is not so strong, what you find when you scratch below the surface is the absence of this clear, adult, healthy, courageous even, conversation. So when I think of organisations, I tend to think of organisations from a different paradigm, not as machine bureaucracies, but rather as social systems. In fact, if I was more specific, what I'd say is that an organisation is simply a social network of interweaving conversations. Nothing in an organisation of any substance takes place without conversation. So for me, the key challenge of the leader, having articulated the corporate story and painted a compelling vision of the future, is to really pay attention to the nature of day-to-day -day conversation in that organisation. If, as I said earlier, we change strategy and structure and processes and systems and all the rest of it, but we don't pay attention to the quality of day-to-day -day conversation, or what I call the discursive landscape of the organisation, nothing in reality will change. So in summary, what have we been talking about here on today's podcast? We've been talking about leadership, change and dialogue. And I've suggested to you that when it comes to thinking about change, we cannot manage it in the same way that we might be able to manage tangible resources. But what we can do is to create a climate within which transformation begins. And leaders, therefore, can create compelling stories that brings people hearts and minds with them on that journey. The critical thing from an ongoing point of view is to manage the quality of that dialogue in the organisation on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's my view that if we do that, we will achieve the outcomes we're searching for when we engage in large-scale change projects. This podcast was produced by Ashridge Business School.